places today. I'd like for you to turn to Isaiah 55 if you'd like to stand. By the way, you got sound in the cry room back there now, so if you need to use that, you can. And I say this not in the form of a rebuke, but as a reminder. When God sees fit to come by in a song service, let alone a preaching service, let alone any time. We often don't pause and say, Lord, we, we just want to tell you thank you. He doesn't come by all the time. When he does, I think he might come more often if we were grateful that when he does and ministers the way he ministered this morning, that we pause when we get ready to have our opening prayer to thank him that he has definitely set the table. And he doesn't do that always, all the time, and everywhere. And it's not because we're special. It's because he's special. Amen. My opening text is one that you're going to be very familiar with, although you may not have read the passage in Isaiah 55. My opening text is found in the book of John, chapter number 3, and verse number... 16. It says this, if I can recall it, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Brother Larry, take us to the throne room, would you please, and ask him to help us. Thank you. You can have a seat. I was pondering and asking the Lord about what to preach, and I think sometimes because we as Bible believers are so interested in moving into, quote, the deeper things, that we forget some of the things in the past. I think when life begins to move on and sometimes even prosperity comes our way, and we start running with a different group, a different crowd. We see ourselves as more mature, able to handle things better. We become somewhat sophisticated people. We get sort of kind of uppity a little bit in the old-fashioned, old-time ways. I was reminded yesterday in, in, a, in, in a wonderful time of fellowship up here working and watching some guys get some stuff done. I was just in the supervisory capacity and that kind of thing. But, but watching them work and listening to them talk and I was reminded of some of the times back in the old building, the little building. I'm reminded of us starting around 9.30 in the morning and going sometimes till 2.30 in the afternoon. Reminded of the time when lightning hit back when Brother Tyrrell was here and blew everything out and 
it was a driving rainstorm and somebody, I don't remember who, went and got their car and pulled it up or their truck and pulled right up to the doors of that place. In those days, none of this was paved or anything. It was pine trees and then we cut down some pine trees and made a, 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 a semi-circle driveway that was covered in mud whenever it rained. And they pulled that car in there and we opened up those doors and all the lights were out and they didn't want to go home. They wanted me to keep preaching. And we would get in there and when I would go to work on Monday, I usually didn't have any voice left because I knew two gears stopping wide open. And I can tell you that my, my heart was right. I had a zeal but no knowledge. I, I dare say probably many of you wouldn't have tolerated it and I wouldn't have blamed you for it. Those were the days where at times I might even call somebody out by name. I meant well, I know that's not apropos for nowadays, but... That's how much we love the Lord. We will witness to a fence post. Go out and hold signs. Go down to the drunks downtown, down to the, to the street down there and, and the bad places. Go down to Confederate Park and go down to the old parks that were down there in those days and stand up on the fountain and, and preach to people. We'd take them uh, cold drinks and hot dogs to draw them in there. and We'd hold up signs and preach and blow the horn and sing some songs and different things like that. And I was reminded of, of those things and how sophisticated we are now because, you know, we have a little bit nicer building. We have a little nicer facilities. We have better air conditioning that doesn't squeal like a rat that's got his tail caught in a trap. My, though, how we've forgotten how good God was to us back in the day. And how close we were and how you men were like standing trout up in the room in here today. And you're 30 or 40 of you jammed in a room there that's no longer big enough to hold you and you're going to have to break out in the parking lot again, I guess. But how we used to feel a little concrete block building right over there. And we'd pray on Wednesday night and God would come down and to the midst and we were all grateful and we had one thing in common, maybe two. One was we knew we were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And two, we believed the Bible and we were just learning. And we were like little brim or little guppies just popping that bread on the water, man. I mean, everything that came along was good. And it didn't matter. I mean, those are, this, is, this is so many years ago. I would get on the pew in the front. Brother Brad would immediately reach up and grab the pew because the pew was right there. We were jammed in there like sardines. Now the Lord had blessed and one time the old preacher came in here and he said, brother, this isn't going to work, man. You got to have a building. You got to have a building. They're standing up alongside the walls and jammed in like that. But this is the day because those pews were not anchored down and uh, they were hind end pinchers. You'd sit down on them. They had made them out of planks, not plywood. They had no padding on them in the beginning. And so if you moved just right, we could get an amen out of you. <laughs> I mean, it would pinch you between your cheek and gum and the oh, whole buddy. I'm telling you now, it would make you, you better have your heart clear because you might say something you shouldn't say. And I'd step off of the platform not knowing any better and I'd hit that first rung right there and the pew would start to tilt and Brother Brad would grab it. And then I'd go and walk all the way on the tops of those pews and preaching and people just looking at me. You know, take nails and drive them into walls and split walls and knock walls down and break spoons, wooden spoons. Favorite paddle got busted. Expensive spoon. Don't use your wife's spoon for an illustration. <laughs> I hit it and it broke. And I mean, I'm telling you, I looked at it and then immediately I looked at it and I'm like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> this is going to cost me more than the price of a spoon. <laughs> And trying to use a cup about the broken vessel and I took a cup one time and I didn't know the difference in corning wear and regular. So when I hit it, oh, it shattered in a million pieces. It was like turned to powder and I'm, now I'm looking at it like I'm standing on the Lord's Supper table, busting the glass. Their answer to that was thicker glass. Not stay off the table, stupid. Their answer was stronger legs, not stay off the table. But oh, how we just love the Lord. And oh, how excited we'd get. And the old preacher was coming in after we'd had about a week of feeding him crack, being in jails and prisons. 
that was like for him, that was the best it could get. He would come in all juiced up and ready to go and man, he would come in and preach and sometimes he'd preach two hours. And we just ate it up. But we were simple folks. Plain folks. Kind of country folks. We just loved the Lord. We were just doing what we could do. And I got to thinking about that yesterday and I don't want to get too far from that. I don't want to get too far from the endearment that I felt for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No matter how well known we may or may not get known, no matter how, uh, well, what ministries we may have and what things God might allow us to be a part of or, or do anything, you do realize God's doing all of this. None of us are doing any of this. Nobody here can take any credit for anything that's gotten done because if you were to try to put the thing down on paper, I could get up here and even Brad himself could get up here and try to show you the numbers and he would have to turn around to you and say, I see the numbers, but I don't know how that happened. I can see the numbers, but I don't know how we're here and don't owe anything. I can see the numbers, but I don't know how we keep having enough to get Brother Holland where he needs to go to the next thing. I see the numbers, but I can't tell you how that happens, but God. Amen. Does it mean we're special? No, it just means that God chose to do something here. It's not because of who we are. Can I say that and make it clear? It's because of who he is. Nobody can take credit for that. In Isaiah chapter 55, I was reminded of my own depravity when I began to read through this passage the other day and I was thinking to myself, you know something, when I got saved, I actually saw myself as a sinner. Amen. Do you realize that when I, I mean, I was seven years of age, you said, what kind of sins? Enough to know I was gonna go to hell. Enough to know that I was gonna burn forever. Enough to know that I didn't wanna be there for 10 minutes, let alone 10 million years. People say, well, preacher, I don't know. You know what it says? You say, what did it cost me? Can I just show you this real quick, if I could, please? Everyone that thirsteth, and look at the cost at the bottom of the passage, without money, without price. Now, I want to say, first of all, that when I got saved, my destiny definitely changed. My disposition should change. That's a fair statement, right? Over a period of time. And my direction changed from going to hell to now going to heaven. You say, why? I didn't have anything to offer. Do you ever pause to think about that? Because see, in the days of sophisticated Christianity, it's kind of like, Lord, let me tell you what I have to offer. It's like, a, it's like a business deal. It's like when we get ready to come and the Lord says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. It's kind of like, okay, well, Lord, I appreciate that, but can I just tell you what I have to offer? And the Lord said, sure, what do you have to offer? I realized at seven years of age, all my righteousness was as filthy rags. Amen. And that he was not interested in my life at all because my life didn't mean anything. Oh, give my life to him. My life wasn't worth anything without Jesus Christ. Amen. What he wanted was is to save my soul. The cost was all upon him. I'm glad that no matter what people try to tell you, when the Bible says that he loved everyone and died for everyone, can I say that it doesn't matter whether you have five children out of wedlock or you're a crackhead, or you're the most sophisticated CEO driving the nicest car, living in the nicest house, and have all of the wares that go with all that kind of stuff. When he said whosoever will, he dropped all of a sudden all your prejudice, all your red and yellow, black and white. It isn't just God bless America. It's God bless the entire world with your presence and save us from ourselves. We're kind of selfish when it comes to the way that we pray sometimes. Nowadays, we spend more time talking about and worshiping the flag instead of the cross or the Constitution instead of the Bible. Instead of singing the doxology, we sing, God bless America. I said something the other day, right prior to on Wednesday, uh, right prior to, listen, I don't want you to think that I, I am not pleased that I live in the United States of America. 
But I'd be a hypocrite to tell you that my faith is in the United States of America, that my faith is in the politicians or the people that run it. Didn't say I didn't pray for them. My faith is in Jesus Christ, and this is his house, and this is his church, and I'm not going to waste his time talking about something that he has allowed to exist. You know why? I can't preach that in any other nation. America has gotten the benefit of what God has chosen to do. But ladies and gentlemen, it has nothing to do with us. It's just God's grace and mercy. But with that grace and mercy, in a period of just a bit over 200 years, we have gone far further and far faster than any other nation that has been in existence since the beginning of time. In a country, albeit with deists, deists that were found, at least in their mind somewhere was the thought, the idea about God and has now been dissipated altogether. And pulpits across America are being used to taunt the political politics of what's best for America. I can tell you who's the best one to put in office, King Jesus. Amen. Vote for King Jesus. Beyond that, all you have is a human instrument. And look, let's be honest. The only reason you vote for whoever you vote for, or lesser of two evils or not, is because it allows you to feel as if you've done something to ensure your longevity. But all it takes is a phone call. All it takes is a diagnosis. <laughs> all it takes is winter time and then that time coming just like Brother Dwayne just about 15 or 20 minutes ago Brother Cruz stepped from this life into the next life. And all of the decisions that he had made up until then they didn't matter except the fact that at one day he had trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Isn't it interesting how quick we get away from the simplicity that is found in the gospel and the church becomes this conglomeration of sophistication and instead of talking about how good Jesus is and in just joy and joy in Jesus, all of a sudden it's kind of like how can we use the church as a vehicle to get better and make a better community? It wasn't here to make a better community. It was here to make a better Christian. It was here for the purpose of training and getting people to go out into the world, the hallways and the hedges, and compelling them to come in. It was done for the purpose of calling prodigals home, for the door to be open and bread to be on the table so when the prodigal comes to the house, the lights are still burning. Oh, how we've gotten so away from the simplicity. The, just the sheer enjoyment of the simplicity of, I remember some of you used to come in and you couldn't wait to tell about the people that you'd led to the Lord or talked to about the Lord. And now it's kind of like, did you see what's happened? Did you see the price of silver? Did you see the price of gold? Did you see what they're doing? I mean, they might be getting hit a nuke here there not long ago. Kim jong un has got a nuke now. Russia's got a nuke now. Putin's down to get us now. They've joined up with so-and-so and this and that and the other and so-and-so and so forth. Okay, we're in church. I don't know, but when I was in school, if I, I, I played a little bit of ball and that kind of thing, my teachers did not care about practice or what game was being played. They would send me to the coaches who would straighten me out and then send me back to the classroom because the classroom was not the place to be talking team strategy. Why has the church become the place to talk about everything but Jesus? I wonder sometimes if maybe the preaching should have been harder and hotter. Maybe you would have hearkened more because the Bible says in verse number two, hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight itself. Incline your ear and come unto me, verse three, here and your soul shall live. I've learned that faith does come by hearing. Yeah. I've learned that if I'm unwilling to hear, my faith doesn't grow. I've learned that even I can have a problem as much as I read the Bible, that I can have a problem before long that clutter or chatter can get in the way. Yes. And the things that used to make my heart, my soul just burn inside, it's kind of like, oh, hey, so-and-so got saved. Oh, well, that's great. 
Brother Horton called. They had a vacation Bible school. They had 20-something kids came from the neighborhoods and all that kind of a deal. And a whole bunch of those kids wound up getting saved. And he was excited about it. Our attitude is, oh, well, that, that's wonderful. That's really great. Did you see that there was a huge hurricane out in the Gulf and it's the biggest hurricane ever and it's headed toward Texas? I remember the days when we were over there and Amway was the big thing. You remember that? Anybody remember that? Do not raise your hands at how many of you signed up for it. But the church became a vehicle. Along with ATIA, Gothard's program, and some other folks that have come up with a, if you do this with your child, their child is going to turn out this way, like it's a guarantee. No qualifications, just misuse of Scripture. And I, I remember when all of a sudden it began to be, oh, I got saved, now let me tell you about my multi-level marketing plan. And before long, that crept into the church and you all of a sudden no longer have church but you have church at whatever meeting place you're gathered at because all of the people are dreaming about the Lamborghini they're going to have and that's up there instead of a picture of Jesus and all of a sudden you begin to see this diametric shift of things being utilized in the church for commercial reasons and purposes. And we preached against it. We preached against things that were outside of the local church. And people would make a profession of faith and then go on to do their business and never be rooted and grounded in the book and never be rooted and grounded in a church because the church was simply a vehicle by which they could do commercial things. And it was no different than when the Presbyterians would come to, join, come to a church and say, where should I go join? Well, the Presbyterians have the money and the Methodists have the connections. And you don't want to be a Baptist because they're contrary to everything. And you join the church that would best facilitate your wallet. And joining Christ is not like joining the church. Amen. You know what he said? He said, first of all, if you're poor and needy and if you're thirsty, I'm looking for you. Amen. Second of all, he notice what he says in there. He said, listen, if you'll listen to me, what winds up happening is, is that we don't hear from God like we used to. You say, why? There's just too many other things going on. We're bombarded constantly with all these things. Hey, listen, I, I, I'm not talking about all your stuff, so quit worrying about me mentioning your social media. I've seen jobs and people working hard and working long hours and spending time to try to get to the point where they have reached this particular pinnacle where they thereby trust in those riches and they're now all of a sudden secure. And once they get that, then they're going to serve God. It's just as dangerous as social media because it takes you away from the main thing. Now all of a sudden we can't make church on Sunday night. We're too busy. We can't make it on Wednesday night. We're too busy. We can't make it for Sunday school. We've been out far too long on Saturday night. Not doing bad, not going to the club, but you know, networking and, and working hard to make sure you get the overtime hours to make sure because why we begin to depend on the overtime hours as our living. And we live right at the edge of every nickel we have. No matter what level you see yourself at, as impoverished or middle class or upper crust, upper class, it doesn't matter, right to the very edge. And I saw it drifting away from, hey, are you saved? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm saved. You still, oh yeah, I'm, I'm saved, I'm eternally secure. But preacher, I got, a, I got a lot of things that's going on right now. And I got reminded that if it wasn't for the Lord, I would have lost purpose in my life. Yes. What's your purpose? I'll grant you some people, they don't know any better. And I'll grant you that it, sometimes it's us preachers who have not properly taught or fed the sheep. 
to make you think, but you're changing and you don't even see it. You've grown cold and you don't even need a jacket. You're frostbitten. Your heart is hard. Do you hear the songs sung and ne'er a tear runs down the cheek and the heart doesn't thump just a little bit faster and the foot doesn't kind of think, man, I should go down there to that altar and all of a sudden what God did for us years ago has been put so far under the underbrush that we no longer believe God really did anything special when He saved us. Now it's him and her and them and it and what about and what about this and all that. All that stuff includes being eclipses, being able to see the Lord. I long for the simplicity of Herbie. Not mean and pigeon-toed. Mentally deficient. But always faithful. Couldn't sing a lick could read even less. But in church, every Sunday and every Wednesday, right there on the second row, the simplicity. He lived to be in church. Now church has become something we do, not what we are. It's here because it'll always be here. It's supposed to be a beacon. Somebody asked me one time, quote, when you build that monstrosity over there called the church, are you going to put a steeple on it? I said, if I had the money, I would do it to spite you. <laughs> because I could do more with a steeple pointing people to heaven than you could do with your critical spirit and your ne'er-do-well attitude because that is the reason people need God and a church is because all you do is go around and kick somebody who doesn't do it. What have you done? Amen. We need money for other things other than window dressing. That's why the building outside is still metal. But I want you to understand, I will be jumped if I'm going to get hung up because somebody takes offense to a Bible or to a cross or to a steeple that's pointing in that direction. I was reminded at my mother's funeral I had forgotten the story. I saw the picture of my dad hanging off, a, off of a crane way up at the top, placing the steeple on the church over there in Arlington. And his desire was is that when you cross the Matthews Bridge that you'd see that steeple and say, there's a church. Nowadays, we become so sophisticated and so critical, it's kind of like, uh, you know, that, that, that thing up there's kind of got a little point to it there. You think that's like a Catholic sign? No, it's where the window fits. Window fits. It's designed that way so that it has a little profile. I'm going to come to your house and say, you got a gabled roof. Do you think that's like a steeple? Or are you pointing people to the Antichrist? Is that a phallic symbol? Why you got all them windows? So we can see out. Amen. To let the light so shine among men. Hey, can I tell you that a light that is underneath a bushel has the potential to be extinguished. Amen. I don't want my light put out. Amen. The simplicity, the liberty, the freedom. Oh, I was... Arrogant, I'm sure, appeared to be anyway. I was obnoxious, appeared to be anyway. But man, all I cared about was Jesus. Amen. And I thought the right way is just to give you a bunch of rules and regulations. I've learned better since. I've learned I can give you a list a mile long. You ain't going to do it if you don't want to do it anyway. But I've seen some of you where God blessed you and you were close to the Lord and now God's blessed you and you forgot where you used to be. When you didn't have a pot to, when you, didn't, when, when, when you were poor. <laughs> you know what's sad is when all I have to do is start and y'all finish it and then I don't even have to say it. 
I'm trying to get better. But now when's the last time you had one of those meetings with God? Does it require a hospital bed? Do you remember the days when you were worried about whether or not you had enough money to make the next meal? Do you remember the days when you were worried about whether to get in and stay in or get out? Do you remember the days where God directed your steps and showed you the way? How quickly we forgot, man, when God was there when we needed Him, but now we got it, we're good. I've learned this much about God. He appreciates it when people admit, Lord, I can't make it without you. I know it's a goofy song or some people think it's a goofy song, but that song that said, Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Hey, can I ask you this? How do you think you got that promotion? How do you think you got that money in the bank? You think it was you? You think it was your intellect? Or you think maybe God set up the dominoes and lined everything up and fixed it so you could benefit on what he was doing just because you were doing the little things? But once we get there, don't we have a tendency to kind of intrude into his? <clears throat> Remember the days when you were willing to go anywhere and do anything? Yes. And nowadays there's this hesitation. Now, Lord, is, we don't want to be the fine line between faith and stupidity now, Lord. I know you wouldn't want me to do nothing stupid, Lord. Back in the day, you didn't care. You'd jump anyway. <laughs> Lord, catch me or I die. I don't care. Change now, hasn't it? Because we're sophisticated. Instead of having that pioneering spirit that got you to where you are, all of a sudden you become reclusive and you become very safe conscious and you become very wary of everything that you do. And what's sad is some of you don't even see you're drifting. You're moving away. And no amount of volume or words will change you. Why? You won't listen anymore. Because you're right. And everybody else is wrong. Notice what he says in verse number six. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he is. Four letter word. You better get it while the getting's good. Because even after you're saved, you know what can happen? Your vocabulary changes. And before long, your company changes. And before long, your dress changes. Your outward appearance. And without you even knowing it, without you even realizing that the rope has come loose from the mooring, the next thing you know, you're drifting in and drifting around people who can't, they don't talk about Jesus. They don't talk about church in the right way. They don't talk about what God's done. No testimony. It's who's next on the dinner table. And it's all about anything but Jesus anymore. You're drifting, you're drifting, you're drifting. Some of you men who God stood by in your darkest hour. You're drifting. God was with you and now your faith is measured by longevity. You're drifting. You're not where you used to be. Sophisticated now. Don't need that. A little bit goes a long way. Learned enough Bible to make you dangerous. Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. I don't want to have to shout to get a hold of him. Notice what he says. I think it's in verse number seven there. Doesn't he say, let the wicked do what? Notice what he says. And let him return unto the Lord, for he will abundantly, abundantly. They brought Paul in, in Acts chapter number 26. And Paul's there before Felix and Agrippa, and they said, Paul, we're going to let you speak. I understand if you have to leave, it's almost noontime, but we got started a little late. And I completely understand I won't talk about you. If you've got appointments, go. It's going to take me a minute. 
And Paul's standing there and they say to the Apostle Paul, Paul, we're going to let you speak for yourself. What do you think, Paul? Paul said, I think myself happy. You're happy? Oh, man. You kidding me? This is my coronation day. This is my crowning achievement. I finally got the audience, the crowd that I wanted to speak to. And I'm happy, well, except for these chains. But I ain't going nowhere. I, I'm not an escape risk. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. What if that was you today? And you're chained to a disease. You're chained to financial ruin. You're chained to a divorce. What if that were you today? Would you say, I think myself happy? No. No, I can't do that, preacher. I, I need the Lord to know my displeasure. Yeah, but all things work together for good. Yeah, but preacher, you haven't experienced what I've experienced. I, I, I will agree with you. That's not the point. The apostle Paul is there and he said, I think myself happy. And he is falsely accused. And Paul said, I'm guilty. How's that? But now that I've said that, not in defense of myself, that's over and done. I'm guilty. But let me just tell you, that's who I used to be. Amen. I think Paul reared back. Praise the Lord for full salvation. My God is still upon the and I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. So I'll praise the Lord for full salvation. God is still upon the throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God he didn't throw me away. Thank God he saw fit to use me in spite of myself. Paul said, I'm happy. Christian nowadays, oh, preacher is just bad. Look, we all have sadness. I'm not making light of that. And we all have failures. Please, I want you to know I'm not making fun or light of that. It's a serious matter. But thank God if you're saved, that blood goes deeper than any stain. And if the Bible is what he says it is, he said if you forsake it, guess what? In him you will find abundant pardon. He can still forgive you. Does that even matter anymore? For God so loved the world. You know, one of the things I like about this passage, we, he talks about how we think in verses 8 and 9. And he tells us, y'all don't think like I do. I, it's just, that's my commentary. They call it the ad-lib commentary. Y'all don't think like I do. You say, why? I find the abundant pardon. And I just want you to know, y'all don't think like I think because if it was you forgiving somebody, you'd hold them accountable and instead of you paying for their sin, you'd be wanting them to pay for their sin. You wouldn't give them a blank check. But I'm not like you. I can pardon whoever I want to. From the crackhead at 8th and Main Street to the prostitute in the jailhouse to the most rich individual sitting in the White House, I can pardon them if they will just listen and turn from their wicked ways. Hey, they will find an endless well of pardon. Don't let sin hold you back in spite of the fact that you might have messed up. Notice what he says in verse 11, trying to hurry, so shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. Shall not return unto me void, and I shall accomplish it which I please and prosper the thing. For you shall go out, oh, there it is, with what? What happened to your joy? Somebody stole it. David says, as I pointed out to you this morning in Sunday school, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. 
What is a good remedy, preacher? Go back to where you started. Before all the kids were born and all the bills came and all the divorces came and all the disease came and all the divisions came and all the diabolical problems came and the demons came and the devil came. That's about all the deeds I can come up with right now. The Davids came. <laughs> Go back to when you saw yourself as a humble recipient of God's amazing grace. And you know what? When you got it then, you didn't think you deserved it. Now we strut around like a peacock, pun intended, as if we earned it. Like we're God's special. I'm a child of the king. I read the prodigal at least once a month, but I try to get it once every couple weeks. Why do you read that? Because I have two individuals in there I'm concerned about. I don't want to be the prodigal because everybody would know my business. But even worse yet, I don't want to be the elder brother who never left but wanted to. The prodigal came from a long way off when he came out of the pig pen. And he smelled like hog dewy when he got back. And the world had taken its toll on him. But can I say this? He got back in fellowship with the father. The elder brother who had been there in the presence of the father all the time, the prodigal was gone. You know where he was? He's right where some of you are, just outside the door. Why? Because you're upset that he did something for the prodigal. You never saw yourself as a prodigal just because your geographic location didn't change. And can I say this to you? When you read that story, you know what you find out? The prodigal got in with the father and the elder brother stayed outside. I read that story. I, I think probably because I'm worried about what people think and, and worried about people watching and stuff like that, I think the chances for me being a prodigal are less than the chances for me being an elder brother. And I think some of you have become an elder brother. And because you've been hanging around the church, you're waiting for the party to be thrown for you. And when the prodigal comes back, smoked by the rest of the world, tatted up from the rest of the world, and, and having the problems and difficulties, somebody that may have been in and out of jail or in and out of prison or in and out of a relationship or any number of other bad things, I think some of you elder brothers never saw yourself that way. But they get back. And you stay just outside the door. I fear that some of you who once saw yourself as a prodigal and now come back thinking you'd never go anywhere. No, nope, you won't. You'll stay and be the elder brother. And mock and belittle and make fun of all the prodigals that come back. Well, I never left because you didn't have anywhere to go or nobody wanted you if you did. <laughs> you ever think when he says, you never threw a party for me and my friends that the father said to him, I didn't know you had any friends. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple things you can say about the prodigal. At least he took his business to a far country. At least he didn't put it on social media for everybody to see. At least he got a job when he ran out of money. At least he tried to work at doing a despicable task and wasn't afraid to get down in the mud and try to earn a living to at least make something so that instead of just running back to daddy, at least he made an effort. There's a few things I admire about him, but buddy... That big hurdle, he jumped. You know what he said? He came to himself. You remember the story. He said, you know, the servants of my father have plenty of bread to eat. I think I'll arise and go to my father's house. And I'm going to say to the father, I'm no more worthy to be called 
thy son. I'm an unprofitable servant. Boy, those steps get long and hard on the way back. And he begins going that way. The devil riding one shoulder and the world riding the other. Doing everything they can to try to hold him back. Just like right now. Some of you right now. The Lord said, hey boy, you one step from the pig pen. You'd never know from the looks of you. You're at the big banquet now. You're looking sharp. You're looking good. One step from the pig pen. Better be careful. Better watch it. Better get back in fellowship with the Father and maybe get some advice. No, I'm, I'm good. Careful. And he starts coming back and he comes to the end of that path. And thank God for God. Because the Father is God in the passage. He sees the boy making the effort. And he turns his attention to the prodigal because the prodigal was willing to listen. God likes that. And before he leaves, he tells the servant, get the stuff ready. And he runs out there and he meets the boy. And the party pooper in the story is the elder brother. You say what? Can't stand it if he's not the center of attention. Can't stand it after all I've done and you're more excited about a prodigal. I, 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 I've always wondered in there, I wonder about the prodigal's mama. He had to have one. He wouldn't have been hatched. I don't know if she was dead. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what the issue was, but I'm just going to say, I bet you if mama was there, mama would probably be throwing biscuit dough up in the air. Jumping around and clapping and said, boy, my boy's home. My boy's home. Well, you know where he was and what he was doing? Spending I, don't, I, don't, I don't care he's home. I don't care he's home. Well, he's been wasting his substance on riotous living. That is in double speak for, I didn't waste anything. I haven't done what he did. I'm not bad like he was bad. All of the time using, mama, look at me. He's like, I, I, don't, I don't care. I'm so glad my boy's home. My boy's home. My boy's home. My boy's home. I don't know how many fatted calves have been fattened and killed and fattened and killed and fattened and killed, but you know what it looks like? It looks like that father kept a calf in there and kept one fat, hoping any minute that he'd come home. You know what God's hoping tonight? He's hoping tonight that you would come home. You say what? Some of you are as close as a pew. You're sitting in a church house. You know what you're saying? Oh, I, I don't see myself as one of those people. Go help those people with Brother Dan in the prisons. They're the ones that need help. There's the, the dirty people, the unclean people, the, the poor people, the wretched people. I, you, you go help them over there. For God's sake, don't have them come here. I just have gotten people to believe we don't cut the heads off of chickens around here and you start bringing people like that in here like a, like a for whosoever will, oh, we can't have that. Well, then it won't be pleasing to the Lord. Amen. You know what the Lord said? I can provide for you, certainly for salvation. But the well will not run dry. And if you're at odds with Him because of something you're doing, you know what all you have to do? Come and ask Him for a drink. I told you this before, coming to a close now. That elderly woman in her mid-80s had been left for three days without any water. Hot, like it's been hot. Old shotgun house. That's a, you can look from one end and go all the way to the other end and the rooms are on either side. The pump had stopped working. She hadn't had any water. And they brought her in. Somebody called in, did a wellness check and they went in there and found her. And when she's laying there, they had to strap her down and rescue because she was tearing everything up and doing all kind of crazy stuff and saying stuff that by her testimony she'd never said before. When I got there and looking at this tiny woman, she wasn't big as a minute, she's a little bitty thing. 
Man, the stuff coming out of her mouth. They finally restrained her and they got that first needle in and had to use a butterfly. It was small veins and stuff. And they got it in there and that fluid started going in. And you can see her kind of start. And you, you knew either she was high on something or she didn't know why she was where she was. And after that first bag went in, they let it go wide open. They hung up another bag and about halfway through that second bag, all of a sudden she looked and she said, who are you and what am I doing here? And I explained to her the situation. I asked the doctor outside, I said, what do you think it is? You think it's dementia, Alzheimer's, what? And he goes, no. He said, it's a simple case of dehydration. I did some research on dehydration. About 75% of people over 50 are considered to be diagnostically dehydrated. I did further research on it. You know what I found out? The older you get, that desire to have your thirst quench goes away. You don't think you need water as much as you really need it. You know what he said? He said, we found out her pump had been out for about three days and she hadn't had anything to drink. I'm telling you right now, if she were to be here, she's going on to be with the Lord now. If she were right here, you'd think she was just as lucid as she could be. You say, why? Just acting out of character because she was thirsty. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Come on. Yeah. Doesn't he say if you're thirsty? Amen. Isn't that what he said? Amen. You can do without food. You can't do without water. He said, are you thirsty? Well, why don't you come and let me give you a drink? Amen. You're parched. You're so parched you don't even know you're acting stupid. You don't even realize that right now in your life that because that, that desire to quench your thirst is gone. It's not even there anymore. I mean, you too. It literally took almost nothing to say, hey, God's good. Amen. Down the altar, you're like, God, you're really good. We sure. Now it's kind of like... Who doesn't know that? And you start thinking of this thing like it's a business deal or something until you go through a really serious problem. And then all of a sudden, you know what you start realizing? You're dry as cracker juice. I said, what will you do? He said, we're going to turn her loose here directly and take her home and make sure that her son-in-law can get the pump fixed to get her some water. But she's fine. She was just dehydrated made some really bad, rash, stupid decisions. Why? She's dehydrated. She is disconnected from the hydrant. Did you know you can be dehydrated and still be in the Father's house? Amen. The prodigal never quit being a son. Is that right? Neither did the elder brother. You can be in either of those two places. But there's one in that story that I'd really like to be about because it doesn't look to me like he struggled like the two sons did. You say, who was it? It was a servant. He had plenty of bread to eat. He just did whatever the father wanted. He got to get in on the brother's party. He got to be a mouthpiece for the father. But you never find a place in there where he's outside the house or running to the pig pen. He's just happy being a servant. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son for me, for you. Have you forgotten? You've gotten disconnected? Say you lost your salvation. You've gotten disconnected. Gotten caught up in the ways of the world. Don't even realize it. Just got busy. Didn't mean it intentionally. Getting a little recognition. Getting, a little, getting, getting, getting uh, recognized now. Church don't mean what it used to mean. Bible don't mean what it used to mean. But it sure got you through during those tough times. Yeah. Well, you know, kids are grown now. Don't really need that like I used to. Huh. Lord God thought they was going to go to prison, man. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know. That's why I was hoping maybe somebody knew somebody in case the kids went out. But yeah, I, and financially, you, you, well, you're okay now, though. I forgot you're, you're good now. 
the job you lost, another one came through, and you, you, you got that now, right? And that old beater car that was falling apart, he, oh, I'm sorry, you got a new one now. You're, you're good. And the food that used to not be in the pantry, it's, you, the, the pantry's full now. Freezer's full. Even got a little bit of green in your lettuce in the pocket to be able to go get your hamburger after the preacher if he ever shuts up. I'm good now. You weren't so good when you went through that first divorce. But the Lord brought you another one along. Everything's good now, isn't it? Boy, sure didn't need him when it was a mess, though. And remember that time you was in the hospital and it was an oh God moment? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Well, you're well now. You're good. You're good. You don't need to worry about that anymore. You forgot, didn't you? You forgot what he did for you when you were calling on him every day. Can I just say this? It was the trouble and the storm that kept you close to him. Amen. And now that he's taken away the trouble and the storm, you don't need him anymore. You ain't about to say, I'm thirsty, Lord, give me to drink. You're not about to say, uh, Lord, I, I, I realize I've kind of let got the cart before the horse here. I need to get things back in the right order. I hope you get where I'm headed. It's not just being grateful for where I came from. It's recognizing that all along the way, I've forgotten how good God's been. Because we get so caught up in the problems of the elder brother. And before long, we don't even realize it. Last but not least, the elder brother's problem. The elder brother's problem was not with the farm. And it wasn't with his brother. The elder brother's problem was with the father. His fellowship with the father had been broken and he thought he knew more than the father. And when the father didn't do what he thought should be done to the prodigal, the elder brother said, you ain't telling me what to do. And he gave a list of things for justification. And here's what you miss in the story. The servant went out, the father went out, but the elder brother never came in. His problem was with the father. What happened? Fellowship got broke because he didn't like the way God was doing things. And the father was so desperate, modern version, that he went out and immediately threw a joint party for his elder brother because we got to make sure we keep the elder brother happy because we wouldn't want him to stay outside. No, the father came back in and joined the party with his son and said, if you want to stay outside, you can. But I want you to get what I'm saying to you. The elder brother's problem all along was the same then as it is now. Your problem is with the father. It is not with the brethren. It is not with the church. It is not with the hypocrites. It is not with the world. It is not with the devil. Your problem is with the father. And because of that, many of you are outside. Still saved. Still part of the family. Still a son but you can't enjoy it. Our Heavenly Father, we...